We have a bird? It's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Good stuff. Couldn't have orchestrated it better. <laughs> that said, as I indicated, my, my job uh, is as Vicar General at Monterey of the Cur Curia. When I first got the job from Archbishop Carlson, I, I even asked him, uh, what, what do I do? He goes, I don't know, you figure it out. I go, okay, okay. No, in all honesty, when, when he's unable to or cannot or chooses not to be present for something, uh, he asked me to kind of represent him in the archdiocese and then as indicated, I, I kind of oversee the activities of the archdiocese and let them do the wonderful work that they do. It's really a, a pretty cush job, I might add. It's pretty simple because we've got wonderful people doing wonderful things and extraordinary ministry is happening around the archdiocese. And today we celebrate the feast of Christ the King. Christ the King. And that idea of king is something that we as American people find just a little bit foreign. After all, didn't we fight a revolution to free ourselves from a king? In all honesty, when I think of king, I, I had this vision in my mind. Now bear with me on this. It's going to take a while to set it up. But we got all morning. <laughs> One of my real heroes in life happens to be a man by the name of Mel Brooks. How many know Mel Brooks? You younger people, uh, you need to get to know Mel. He was a genius behind such classics as Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, Spaceballs. And there's another one that maybe not as well known. It's called History of the World. And in this movie, Mel decides to take little snippets from very important historical occurrences and then to kind of put his own personal spin on these historical occurrences. One of my favorites is, happens to be that of Moses. Moses had been up to the mountaintop. As he came down the mountaintop, looking very much like Charlton Heston, he had in his arms three tablets. And he goes, I have here the 15. And with that, he tripped a little bit. One of the tablets fell out of his arms. It broke into pieces. He goes, I, I have here the 10. Yes, the 10 commandments. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to know what those other five were? Uh, Mel must have been on a roll because the, the next couple little segments were just as outrageous. But the one that I'm centering in on happened to take place in revolutionary France in the 18th century. As you know, the, the poor were revolting against the extravagances of the king and the royalty of France at the time. Louis XIV had spent a fortune building his palace at Versailles, broke the nation. And a couple of generations later, with Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette, it reached a boiling point. And they were about to revolt against him. And he could sense that people were mad at him. And he was kind of frustrated. This is, again, in Mel's mind, what was going on. And so here Louis was talking about, people say, I don't love the poor. I love the poor. I take care of the poor. At the time he was saying this, he was doing some skeet shooting. You know what skeet shooting is when these little clay pigeons go flying across there? And he had a gun in his hand. I love the poor. And with that, he goes, pull. And with that, instead of a clay pigeon, there was a poor person flying across the sky. And he's taking aim. And you go, that's Mel. That's, that's pretty much what he did. Outrageously stupid stuff, but you kind of laugh a little bit about it. But what was going on at the time certainly wasn't a laughing matter. And the same thing that was occurring in France occurred in our own country some 20 years earlier. And that was a revolt against the, the aristocracy, primarily as envisioned in this, this right to, God-given right to royalty in the king. And so, you know, our own patriots, they fought against the tyranny that they felt was being imposed upon them by King George. And the people of France revolted against the tyranny they thought was being imposed upon them by the rule of, of Louis XVI. And so these revolutions did take place and changed the whole course of history and the course of our, our own, own universe. And in doing so, they revolted against what they perceived as this oppressive nature of a king. But that's the image we have of king, isn't it? It's somebody who wears that crown on his head, kind of like the crown I'm wearing on my vestment this morning. This is the crown of, of another king, another Louis, Louis IX. Only Louis IX was not your typical king. We call him St. Louis. And Louis IX, or St. Louis, did wear a crown. He was the king, after all. And kings wear this crown made of precious metal and embossed with, with precious gems. 
And they do have this, this huge power over people. Louis IX, however, used his wealth to truly help people. He was a man of charity and a man of courage and a man who did his best to protect what he believed important in our own Catholic faith, leading the Crusades and doing other things to maintain the, the, the Catholic identity of charity and Christian justice. And yet, this was several generations, of course, before the atrocities of, of Louis XIV and on to Louis XVI. All of that said, the king and the crown, kind of synonymous. And yet, not just simply the crown, but where does the king live? In a palatial place called a palace. And what does the king sit on? A, a throne, a throne that other people kind of bow down to and, and give homage towards. And so, when Jesus came into this world, he came to establish a kingdom. Now, what kind of kingdom would this be? Would it be that kind of a kingdom? Of course not. Jesus didn't walk around with people attending to him. He walked around attending to people. Jesus didn't have people come down and bow before him. He got down on his knees and took care of their needs. Jesus, instead of being selfish, was selfless. This is the kingdom that he was espousing. This is the kingdom that he came to establish. And why did he do so? Because he said, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard what awaits us. He was giving us a preview of what awaits us in heaven. This kingdom of heaven that seems to be kind of remote and far off is not so remote and far off after all. It's right here on earth. He's bringing the kingdom of God's love down into our midst. And he's saying, this is what the kingdom is about. It's of selfless giving. It's a kingdom of justice and peace. It's a kingdom of charity and love. This is the kingdom that I'm espousing. This is the kingdom that I've brought to this world. And he did so in spectacular fashion. Whether it's through his mesmerizing parables, that had people scratching their heads saying, he's really countercultural. He says, love the poor. What's he, is he crazy? The poor. The poor are poor because God doesn't like them, right? Jesus said, that's ridiculous. They're poor, poor, sometimes beyond their circumstances. Love the poor. Take care of those who hurt you. Turn the other cheek when they smack you in one. These are all countercultural. This is not the kingdom that people were expecting. They thought they would have this earthly king who would reestablish the glory of David, as we heard about in that second, first reading. The glory of the kingdom that they envisioned would one day be theirs. This is the kingdom that they were thinking would happen. And this is what the leaders thought of their Messiah. And Jesus was not going to have any of that. Now, Jesus, in fact, turned the tables on the leaders and said, you've got to take care of the needs of others, not them taking care of your needs. This is the kingdom that he envisioned. And this is a kingdom that got them in trouble because they wanted no part of this kind of a kingdom. It took away their own personal power. It reminded them that they were but, but human and that God truly is in charge. They weren't ready to give up their own personal powers. And so they turned on him. You saw the result. Yes, he then became a king that the soldiers mocked. And then they scourged. And they put a crown on his head, not made of gold and gems, but made of thorns. And his throne was not of one of opulence in a palace. It was on a hilltop where others were being killed. And his throne was made of wood, shaped like a cross. And his scepter, he didn't have a scepter, he had nails instead in his hands. That was the kingdom that he gave to us. And even above his head were the crimes that he was guilty of. As we heard in the gospel, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. Jesus of Nazareth. The I-N-R-I that we see emblazoned above every crucifix that we own. That I-N-R-I is the crimes that he was convicted of. There's no J in the Latin language, and so the I becomes a J. And so you got Jesus of Nazareth, I-N-R is X for king, and the I of Jews. Jesus, Nazareth, king of the Jews. That's his crime. And yes, he said, yeah, even Pilate asked, are you a king? Well, you say I am. And so Jesus went to that cross. And he went to the cross. Why? He was going to establish the kingdom that we now enjoy forever right here on earth. He was combining the two. The kingdom that awaits us in heaven and the kingdom that's right here right now. He was merging the two. So that when we establish ourselves as part of this kingdom, it's not something that we're here for a temporary time. Then we move on to the next kingdom. No, it's right here, right now. 
I went to a funeral a couple of weeks ago. Father Gene Brennan passed away. His brother, Father George Brennan, gave the homily. And none of you know the Brennan brothers, but they are characters. And uh, uh, they were uh, very, very tight, very, very close. Not only being brothers and brother priests, but they were very close friends as well. And George gave the homily for his brother's funeral. And he gave a wonderful little homily. He said, you know, I was kind of more into the pastoral sense of things. Gene was the theologian. And so Gene used to remind me about baptism. He said, you know, when we're baptized, we are baptized into the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of eternity has begun with our baptism. It's not there it begins at death. It begins at baptism. That's when eternity begins. We are born into God's family at baptism. At baptism, we become not only the child of our mother and father, not only the child of our godparents, we become God's child. We are part of God's family. As part of God's family, then we are born into eternity at the day of our baptism. And so this time that we have here on earth is a transitory time, of course, but it is obviously an, an expression of how we are bought, brought into the eternal love of God forever. And Jesus made manifest that when he went to that cross and showed us that, yes, death happens, but it's not the end. Because what took place three days later? He rose. He beat death. And he said, death, eh, it's going to happen. But that's not going to stop eternal love. That's what we are a part of. That's what we celebrate today. Christ the King. The kingdom here on earth, but the kingdom that is forever. The kingdom of eternity right here on earth and in heaven. The two are kind of merged together. And yes, Jesus gave us the example of what we should be doing in this kingdom because he said, you're going to see it in its perfection in the life that is up there. Up there, we always call it up there. I don't know what's up there. Maybe over there. But the bottom line is, it's heaven. And this heaven that we have is theirs. And it's ours. And it's all of ours forever. And we say this in, in all of gratitude. Because Jesus invites us to be a part of this. He invites us. He says, follow me. And I will lead you to the love of the Father. Eyes haven't seen. Ears haven't heard. What awaits you? And so... We get kind of glimpses of this in this life here on earth. We get glimpses of what this love of God is about. And these glimpses are but previews of what is still out there. And these glimpses might be something as special as maybe, uh, maybe the day you married your spouse. Maybe it was the, the day that, that you, uh, you saw the birth of your first child. Maybe it was the day that, that you were witnessing the death of someone you love for the first time, like a parent, like a grandparent. Maybe it was just something, <laughs> I passed that test. <laughs> I didn't think I'd get through it, but I passed my test. I feel pretty good. Maybe it's any number of things, but this is how God is saying, this is my love for you. It transcends all of this. The love of God transcends everything. The love of God is all-encompassing. <laughs> And God is saying to us, now that you've got this, this is my son, listen to him. What did Jesus say? Follow me. We have no recourse but to live as he taught us, to follow the example he's given us. And in following the example he's given us, then we can be assured of the kingdom that is ours. The kingdom that, again, has no pain, has no hatred, has only perfect joy and perfect happiness. That's the kingdom that awaits us. That's the kingdom worth fighting for. That's the kingdom worth living for. That's the kingdom that is ours, right here, right now. But, like any kingdom, we always are there, accepting any guidance, any gifts that God can give us. There's no greater gift than that which we are celebrating right here, right now. It doesn't get any better than this. Jesus is once again saying to you and I, take all that I have. I'll give you everything. I'll give you my life. There's no greater gift than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And my friends, it's good to know Jesus calls us his friend. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.